Amen. Deuteronomy chapter number 20, and part of the chapter that I would like to focus on is in verse number 8. Deuteronomy 20, verse number 8. It says, And the officers shall speak further unto the people, and they shall say, What man is there that is fearful and faint-hearted? Let him go and return unto his house, lest his brethren's heart faint as well as his heart. It's a very good chapter, very interesting chapter. I mean, all the chapters of the Bible are good, but this is a chapter based on, or, or the, the topic is the rules of war. If you have any kind of questions, if you want to watch like the, the, the news, like Fox News and things like that, and look at the American War Machine, and then read Deuteronomy 20 and see if they kind of line up, because... Uh, uh, God gives very specific details about what we should do in war. But this sermon is not about war and what we should do in war. This sermon is about something else. This sermon, uh, the title of the sermon is The Cancers in the Christian Life. The Cancers in the Christian Life. And I don't want you to think that I'm making light of cancer or anything like that. But cancer is an illness that has affected and touched all of us, right? We all probably have been affected by cancer one way or another. You know, you either know somebody that's had cancer or you, uh, you know, related somebody or maybe perhaps that you've had some kind of cancer or something. But it's something that affects us all. Let me give you a couple of uh, stats on cancer. Again, uh, this is not specifically about cancer. But the Bible says that this, uh, I'm sorry, the, this uh, study says this disease accounts for 7.4 million deaths worldwide. Uh, cancer is said it's the leading cause of death worldwide, causing around 13% of all deaths. Uh, the leading types in their mortality rate for each year is each year 1.3 million are diagnosed uh, with lung cancer, 803,000 stomach cancer, uh, colon cancer 639,000, liver cancer 610,000, and breast cancer 519,000. This study says that one in four people will die with some form of cancer in the United States. Which that's a that's a very high figure. You know that's a very high figure. But again, cancer is something that that is very scary. People will have issues. They'll go to the doctor, and the doctor says, "Hey, I think it's cancer. Or you have a spot or something like that." And you know we can become very alarmed about that, and we can kind of take a step back and look at ourselves and look at our lifestyle and look at our choices and say, hey, you know, maybe it's time to make some different choices. So, all right. The purpose of this sermon is to show you that there's some cancers that grow and that they get worse, these cancers in the Christian life. And I want to show you that it could happen to any of us. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 10. The first thing that I want to point out is that cancer in the Christian life occurs naturally. It occurs naturally. And I don't know if you know it or not, but cancer, the actual uh, disease, I guess, uh, is, is what I will call it, it occurs naturally in the body. It's happening in your body and in my body right now. All cancer is is mutated cells, and these happen naturally, okay? I'm not saying that they're good, but they happen naturally, okay? They happen every day in every human being's life, and God, because God created us perfect, God created us complete, and God knows how to take care of us, right? So God created us, our own little trash system, right? Our immune system and our lymphatic system, they take care of this trash. So here's what happens. You're in your body, you have these cells that mutate, right? These mutated cells and they attack the, the good cells, right? Well, our trash system that God has made in, inside of us takes care of those mutated cells. It takes those cells and it destroys those cells, okay? And, and that way they can't attack the, uh, the other cells, the good cells. But that happens every day in our lives. But you think about it. Here, well, here's the issue. So why do people develop cancer if it happens every day in our lives? Why, don't, why doesn't just everybody have cancer? Well, here's the thing. Well, those mutated cells, whenever your lymphatic system and your immune system take care of those and they annihilate and destroy those cells, what happens is, it, it, you know, is you're healthy. Well, when you overtax that system, whenever you give that system other duties than what it's God designed it to do, and it's busy, it can't take care of those things. So then it starts attacking uh, the other cells, and it starts destroying those cells. That's the problem. Okay, that is the problem. And I'll give you an example. Here's an example. Uh, if whenever the kids are here, if I give one of my kids chocolate cake to eat, right? So one of my kids, and I give him chocolate cake, it's going to be kind of easy to clean up after him, but what if all of the kids are here and we give them all chocolate cake or we have a daycare here? It's going to be a whole lot more difficult to clean up that mess, right? You think about this. We're going to say that you're going to wash the dishes at home, okay? You're going to wash the dishes at home, so you turn the sink on, right? You turn the sink. And well, then your toddler, he, he, start, he makes a mess, right? He spills something. So you go and you start trying to clean up that mess, right? 
and then the baby uses the bathroom. So then you're trying to take care of, you're trying to take care of this baby's diaper, right? And the uh, maybe you're fixing to go somewhere and you've dressed the toddler, right? If you ever dress the toddler and then you're trying to take care of the baby and you're getting the baby dressed and then you turn around and the toddler's naked again and the toddler's running down the hallway, he's naked, you know what I mean? So I say all that and then the meantime all of this happens, you've Oh man, I left the I left the uh, the sink on, and the sink's overflowing, and then you have that mess or whatever. So again, uh, what you're designed to do, or what you're trying, your main purpose is, is hey, I was trying to just you know get the dishes done, but you get all of these things that distract us away from what our main task is, and things get out of hand. That is why cancer is rampant because we give our bodies too much to do through what. Uh, smoking, eating horrible foods, eating all of these G uh, GMO foods, all of these processed foods. Uh, we do, we uh, give our bodies so much to do and our system is trying to clean all that other garbage out of our lives. And you think about the environment too. Yes, there's pollutions and things like that, uh, uh, cell phones, but there's just a host of, of things that our bodies do a fantastic job of fighting off. But again, we overtax that and these mutated cells, they go unchecked. They're not getting cleaned up because you know our bodies are, are busy because you know we're eat, we're on our sixth uh, ho ho or ding dong or whatever you know what I mean and the body's trying to clean that garbage out of our system and it doesn't have time to check that because we're sitting there smoking cigarettes and the body's trying to uh, 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 because the body tries to get down to j j a uh, an alkaline state you know the body tries to get down to uh, kind of a uh, a normal non-acidic state all the time it is always trying to do that and when you overtax it and and it's not able to do that that's when we're we susceptible uh, for those mutated cells the cancer cells to get out of hand does everybody understand well we give our body too much to do and the cancer goes unchecked that's like sin in our lives okay it's like sin in our lives sin occurs naturally in our lives we are all sinners. 1 John 1 10 says that we say that we have not sinned. We make him a liar and his word is not in us. So your holiness friend that, uh, that you know that says that they don't sin anymore, that they've stopped sinning, well, they're lying. Because they say that they're stopped sinning, but what are they doing? They're watching John Hagee and Joyce Meyer and, and, and all of this other filth that they do. And, and nobody's without sin in here. I'm not without sin, and neither none of you all are without sin. We all sin, and everybody is hypocritical, and everybody's just, I mean, I guess it's just foolishness to sit and think that once you're a Christian, you don't sin anymore. You do sin any, you know, more. Should we, you know, now, am I committing grievous sins? Am I going out and getting drunk and all of these other things and committing adultery and things? No, absolutely not. But you know what? The thought of foolishness is sin, you know, and, and if you know to do good and you doeth it not, to him it is sin. The Bible says that whatsoever is not a faith is of sin, you know? And I'm telling you, I'm praying on the way here, right, this morning, driving, and my mind wanders. My mind wanders and I have foolish thought that pops in my head, work enters my mind and some other things. So I'm telling you that you are not perfect and I am not perfect and we all have sin in our lives that we need to try to turn away from and we need to deny the flesh every single day. Sin is very natural. So uh, it's unnatural for somebody to say, well, I don't sin anymore. They're a liar. They do sin. Everybody sins. So again, sin is natural. Look at 1 Corinthians 10. It says, But there hath no temptation taken you, but such as common to man. So sin, there are common sins to us, okay? Now, we're, we're not talking about unnatural sins. That's not the topic here, you know, but uh, sin is common for us. Other than if you're some kind of uh, reprobate reject by, by God and you're doing all these unnatural weird sins. But sin is common to us. And these cancerous sins in our life are very common to each and every one of us. And I want to talk about that. So what are some of these common sins I want to talk about? I want to talk about fear. I want to talk about unbelief, bitterness. Conforming to the world, murmuring, anger. I want to talk about these things. You know what? And you're not a bad person if you do these things. You know, I'm not saying, well, you're just a wicked person. No, you're a person, period. You're a person. And you know what I can tell? If, if you're susceptible of having this stuff come into your heart and take over you, if it goes unchecked, I can tell that you have a pulse. You know, I can tell that you're alive because that is, is a normal sin that we're all tempted with. But these are going to be things that happen in your Christian life that occur naturally, just like cancer does. But if they're left unchecked, they can grow, they can spread, they can overtake you, and they will destroy you without a doubt. As we've seen, 
The second point I want to make, number one, is that cancer occurs, these cancers in the Christian life occur naturally. Secondly, cancer in the Christian life, they can spread. If left unchecked, cancers in the Christian life can grow and overtake our bodies. Let's see how cancer, go to Deuteronomy, uh, you're in Deuteronomy 20, uh, or go back. Uh, let's see how cancerous cells can, uh, or these cancerous sins can spread. Go to Deuteronomy 20. The first one I'm talking about is fear. And we saw it in our, our uh, key verse. It says, And the officers shall speak further to the people. This is verse 8. And they shall say, What man is there that is fearful and faint-hearted? Let him go and return into his house, lest his brethren's heart faint as well as his heart. Go to Numbers chapter 13. It will lead us into our next point, which is unbelief. The fear that you have can cause your brother's heart to faint. So it, it's not that your actions don't affect anyone else, but the cancer, the spreading of unbelief, as we see in this scripture, can spread to other people. So if I am afraid and I am fearful, I can actually cause you guys to become afraid or feel fearful. So again, if, if fear is something that I leave unchecked in myself and I allow myself to fear, which I believe fear and unbelief go hand in hand, but uh, because even though, even it says over in Revelation, it says, but the fearful and unbelieving, okay, kind of lumps those two together. But again, if I allow those things to go unchecked, it can spread, and it can spread to all of us, and it can eventually destroy us. Okay, Numbers chapter 13, the second point is unbelief. So fear and unbelief. Numbers 13, verse number 25, and it says, And they returned from searching after the land forty days, and they went in and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation. This is the spies that Moses sent out to spy the land of Canaan. And they went in and came to Moses and Aaron and all the congregation of the children of Israel until the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh and brought back word unto them and unto all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him and said, We came into the land whither thou sent us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. And the Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites, and the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea, and by the coast of Jordan. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses, and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are able to overcome it. So Caleb's got the right attitude, right? He trusts God. He knows that God's going to deliver. This is the promised land. So if God promised us this land, He's going to deliver that land, right? That's what Caleb, Caleb, uh, he believes in that promise. So he's like, I don't care what we saw down there. I don't care how big the giants were. I don't care how formidable the armies were. You know what? God said, God promised us this land. So it's ours. Hello. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to believe. I'm not going to fear. I'm going to believe in that promise of God. Caleb didn't. Uh, uh, he wasn't uh, swayed by that. Look at verse number 31. But the men of, that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. So they, again, they're not believing, are they? Right? And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, the land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, so we were in their sight. So just a few men, not all of them, right? Caleb didn't. But just a few men had an attitude of unbelief, of fear about what they saw in the land of Canaan, okay? So this is, they are the majority. It doesn't matter. It's not everyone, right? So what happened when these few men, they didn't allow their fear to go unchecked. They just allow their fear to spread. They got distracted. They're not taking care of those things. They're not looking at the promises of God. They, they got distracted by what? By the giant people, by the formidable foes. So they're over here. They're not doing what their purpose is, is to, is to start forming a plan and start relying on God and believing God. So they're distracted over here and they're letting their fear and their unbelief go unchecked. So what happens? It starts spreading. It starts spreading. Look at Numbers 14, verse number 1. Look what it says. And what? All. You see that? All the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. And the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron. And the whole congregation said unto them, Would to God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would to God that we had died 
in the wilderness. But we need to be aware that our unbelief can rub off on the congregation. You know, God has a promise for us, and if we don't hold to that promise, if we allow uh, this world to get to distract us, if we allow the, the size of the job to get distract us, uh, we're not going to uh, get our fear in check. And that can spread to the congregation. What is our report? going to do to the congregation. Whenever we go out and we're going sowing and we come back, what's our report going to do to the people? Hey, it's an unreceptive area. We can't do that. We can't do anything with it. What's that going to do to you guys? You know, if I said week in and week out, if you guys were like, hey, we need to go soul winning, man, I really want to, you know what, it's really an unreceptive area around here, you know, I mean, and pastors do that all the time. They have an evil report and what it does is it causes those people to, to, to not believe. They said, you know, have you ever heard it's a gospel-hardened area? Anybody ever heard that? This is a gospel-hardened area? No, it's just you're lazy. But, uh, and again, but their unbelief, these pastors' unbelief, and these, these church leaders' unbelief, and them giving a bad report has affected their congregations. And they don't believe that God can work through that. We, we went to a, and visited that church uh, uh, recently, and... They, they've given up on, on what God can do in their lives. They're not allowed God to work through them. Why? Because they have unbelief. Why? Because they believe these evil reports. Why? Because they've allowed their, belie their unbelief and their fear to go unchecked. They've been distracted by all of these bad things in the world, and they allow those things to go unchecked, and they allow those to grow and fester. And guess what? It affects everybody. It affects the whole congregation. Go to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. So fear and unbelief, which I believe go hand in hand. And thirdly, what? Bitterness. Bitterness. We can allow bitterness. Because we are all susceptible of getting bitter. All of us. Of getting bitter. Of getting angry. Of getting bitter. We get our toes stepped on. We get our feelings hurt. I was supposed to sing in the choir. I was supposed to be chosen to do this. I was supposed to be doing this. I was supposed to be uh, uh, so-and-so didn't talk to me. He didn't during the fellowship. Uh, she didn't shake my hand. You know, I mean, we all are susceptible. And, and you say, well, that sounds stupid. I'm telling you, that happens every day, doesn't it? Silly things that people get upset about. People, uh, and they'll quit church over. They'll quit church over. I've seen it time and time again. People, you know, they come to homecoming. Well, Susie fixed a, a, a cherry pie. Oh, I fixed a cherry pie and more of her pie got ate, so I'm quitting church. You know what I mean? So it happens. People quit church. People give up on God uh, for, for stupid reasons. How many people have heard the, the, the excuse or heard, and it is an excuse, but the statement, I don't go to church because there's a bunch of hypocrites there. How many people? Out, out, so there's nothing. There's a bunch of hypocrites there or whatever. Well, you know what? Come on and there'll be one more. Okay? So what do you think about that? You know, do you go to Walmart? There's hypocrites there. Do you go get gas? There's hypocrites there. You know, there's sinners there. Do you eat at restaurants? There's hypocrites there. There's hypocrites everywhere. Okay? Uh, uh, hopefully that uh, God's people here at All Scripture Baptist Church are not going to be hypocrites. Are we sinners? Amen. Yes, we sin every day. We need to forsake uh, and repent of those things. But again, uh, uh, should we be hypocrites? No, we shouldn't. You know, we should practice what uh, we preach. But again, what's happened in that person's life? They've been wronged somehow. Maybe. Maybe in their mind. Maybe they've legitimately been wronged. I don't know. But regardless of what, they've got this bitterness inside them that has spread. And they don't go to church anymore, do they? And what do they do? Well, who do they affect? They affect their kids, their grandkids. You know, you meet some older people that have not uh, been in church in years and years and years. Well, I used to go to such and such church, but, you know... Those people are hypocrites over there. And you know, and their grandkids are there playing. Well, who's going to take your grandkids to church? Who's going to take your daughter to church? You know, who, uh, so again, their bitterness has affected other people. Hebrews 12, verse number 15. It says, Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God. Look what it says, lest any root of bitterness. So again, we have a beginning, we have a foundation of this bitterness springing up to trouble you. And look what it says, and thereby many be defiled. You see that? Many be defiled. Research suggests that constant bitterness can actually have a negative effect on our physical health. Bitterness predict, uh, may predict adverse changes in metabolism, immune system function, and organ function. Getting rid of grudges may also reduce anxiety and lower, lower uh, blood pressure. In some people, forgiveness may be even improve cardiovascular health. So, uh, somebody said the elimination diet. Remove anger, regret, resentment, guilt, blame, and worry, and then watch your health and life improve. Let me tell you something. 
is, is smoking a sin? Yes, I believe smoking is a sin. I believe uh, overeating is a sin. I believe like gorging yourself on McDonald's and fast food and stuff. I think that's sinful. All sorts of things that I believe are sinful as far as hurting and damaging our body. I mean, 100% guaranteed. But as far as on a secular view, just a secular view, we're just going to leave the Bible and God out of it on a secular view. Did you, I guarantee you that stress and overeating will kill you quicker than cigarettes. I guarantee you that stress and bitterness will kill you quicker than a lot of things, you know, because it is so taxing on your body, uh, this anger and bitterness and resentment. It's like a knot in your stomach. And I don't know, I've been bitter before, and I don't know about you guys, but, you know, maybe uh, maybe you guys are not, have not uh, experienced that, but it, it, it eats at you, you know. What was it uh, uh, a popular saying said, to be bitter against someone is like, uh, me drinking poison and waiting for that person to die. I don't know if you guys have ever heard that. But it's only going to hurt you. This bitterness is only going to hurt you. And here's the bottom line in our lives. You all are going to make me mad someday. Okay? I'm, you all are going to do stuff that gets on my nerves, that I, aggravates me. I'm going to do stuff that gets on your nerves and is going to aggravate you. Uh, uh, Brother Jason, you're going to do something that, that, that aggravates Brother McMillan. He's going to frat Jason, you know. And <laughs> but we're all going to do things that aggravate one another. We're all going to disappoint one another at some time. I mean, it may happen. The closer we get and the more you're around one another, it is inevitable that we're going to disappoint one another. We're going to get on each other's nerves. We're going to get aggravated at one another. But you can't allow th this bitterness to come, in, to come between you, and you can't allow this root of bitterness to take hold of your heart. You can't allow that. You know, uh, uh, not saying that I caution people. Uh, my uh, my uh, papa, he said... Uh, he was an unsaved man, but he had a, a couple of good sayings. One of them, he said, if you deal with Christians or family, get a receipt. That's what he said. <laughs> but I say all that to say, you, whenever you start having dealings with, with, with people, it, the, it's very volatile, in my opinion. Whenever you start having close dealings with someone, you know, like if I went to work for, for Brother Chris or, or, or what have you, to, to have these close relationships, we need to make sure, or like people dating, for example, because I've seen it in dating. Like, we need to make sure, like if, if a young man in here uh, and a young lady in here was dating or something like that, we need to make sure that these separations, that we don't allow this bitterness in our heart, that we don't allow, uh, uh, that we can still come to church with one another. We don't need to allow work relationships. We don't need to allow living relationships. We don't allow, need to allow like disagreements over business. You know, I hire uh, uh, Brother Aaron to come and do some, some woodworking for me, which I don't know if you do that or not. But uh, if you do, holler at me after the service. But no, uh, I hire him to do some woodworking for me, right? And he does a sloppy, junky job or whatever. You know, you have to entertain these possibilities that, you know what? Aaron's going to come to my house and he's going to stiff me or he's going to do a sloppy job or whatever. Can can I not be bitter against him? You know, that's the kind of stuff that I'm talking about. You can't allow bitterness in your heart. And you know what? Should he do a good job if he comes to my house? Absolutely. He should do an excellent job. He should treat me better than he treats everybody. He should treat everybody fantastically. And I'm not saying he does woodworking. You're going to get phone calls from this brother. But <laughs> people you know, trying to get job bids from you. And I'm not saying that... that, that uh, uh, you know, he shouldn't treat everybody right. But you know what? You should be above board when you're dealing with God's people. Amen. If I come to your house to do some electrical work or, or, or I'm trying to help you do something, I should work hard and I should be above board to, to, to help you out and to do you right and to treat you right and to be fair in business or money or whatever it may be. But again, but we need to realize that if I stiff you, if he stiffs me or whatever, number one, we need to let that go. We shouldn't be like, uh, uh, I sue you and all this other junk. We shouldn't do those things. But again, I shouldn't ultimately allow that bitterness in my heart to grow and spread. Because look what it says in Hebrews. It says, thereby many shall be defiled. Because you know what? If, if Your life's going to end up being like, that's all I do is I hate. I hate Brother Grooms. That's, I wake up and I think about how much I don't like him, you know? And I'm not saying I don't like you or whatever, but you understand what I'm saying. That bitterness will take over, and we need to conduct ourselves better than we would with the world, whenever with, with God's people. And you know what? But again, it doesn't matter. If, if you uh, uh, cheat me out of money or you, do, uh, uh, you do, do me wrong, and you legitimately do me wrong, even if we went through a process of where I went to you and then I talked to your, you know, and then we took, and you wouldn't listen to me, you know, the biblical process. And then we took a brother, a couple of the men of the church, and we talked and we tried to hash out an issue. 
even if we went through that process, and you're welcome to do that process, right? I still shouldn't allow that bitterness in me, right. you know? Amen. Period. Because, you know, you think about it. If, if you cheat me out of money and then I go to you, hey, man, I, I really need this money and you really need to pay your bills or whatever. You really need to uh, 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 pay for the, the work that I did at your house or whatever. And, and you're like, okay, and you don't pay me. And then I go and according to what the Bible says and I grab a couple of other men and I talk to you and we try to get it hashed out and we still don't get it hashed out. And then I brought it before the church and the church is like, hey, let him be a heathen man in the publican or whatever. I still shouldn't have that bitterness in my heart against you, Okay. Even if I do that process, even if I'm justified and you're condemned, I shouldn't have that bitterness in my heart. And you know what? If you were condemned because of that, you shouldn't have your bitterness in your heart. You know? So again, we can't allow bitterness to rule us because it will in a heartbeat and it will destroy your Christian life. It will destroy it. And I've seen it time and time again. Go to Galatians chapter number 2. So bitterness. We have fear. We have unbelief. We have bitterness. We all have that potential because we all... I say wrong each other. We all do things. And, and if we walk around like snowflakes with powder puff feelings and, and we're just, you know, waiting on people that, to hurt our feelings or waiting on somebody to, uh, 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 you know, do us wrong, it, it's inevitable. I mean, it's coming. Your time's coming, you know. Your time is coming. Because, you know, the Bible says, what do you more than others, you know. As long as y'all are being good to me, I like you, you know. What about when you're not good to me? Am I still going to like you? Am I still going to not be bitter against you? You know, what do you more than others? We need to be better than what the world is. Right. And what the world is, is no matter if you do me wrong, I'm not going to have bitterness against you. I'm going to be forgiving, which we'll talk about that in a minute. All right, conforming to the world, Galatians chapter number 2. Verse number 11, it says, But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. For before where certain men came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But then they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. And the other Jews disassembled likewise with him, insomuch that even, I'm sorry, that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. So, peer pressure. What, what's happened? What's happened? Peter, right? These guys who were Jews, right? And, and, and it's talking about that they came from James. So we don't know that these guys were uh, like false teachers or anything like that. They were Jews. They may have been circumcised or whatever. The Bible doesn't indicate here that these people that came from James, they were just, they're Jewish people and they were circumcised, okay? But Peter, where he's hanging out with the Gentiles, the uncircumcised people, whenever these Jews come there, he stops hanging out with them and he's hanging out with the, circ the people of the circumcision. You know, and, and Peter's the one that's been telling them, hey, circumcision availeth nothing. You don't have to be circumcised to be saved and all of this. And then he breaks company with them and he goes and hangs out with these, uh, these Jews. Okay, And I'm not saying that they were bad guys or unsaved guys. The Bible doesn't indicate that. You know, It talks about that them coming from James. But the fact was, they were circumcised Jews. So he's hanging out with them but, and he's dissing the Gentiles, right? So the Gentiles are like, well, you know, why isn't Peter hanging out with us, you know? Why is he going to hang out with his other crowd? Why? It's because they're circumcised. It might compel them to become circumcised. But again, they were going out and they were hanging out with the Jews at this point. So they're going to have that compulsion to possibly get circumcised. And then Barnabas, a church leader, also is going and hanging out with them. So what's happening? You have Peter that's hanging out with these people that he shouldn't be really be hanging out, especially he shouldn't diss God's people, right? And you have other people following along. So that would be like that in a mixed crowd, we're going to say that I see like a bunch of my unsaved friends, which I don't have. I mean, I have some unsaved associates, but that's another story. But I see all them and I start hanging out with them. I start hanging out with all of these people at my, uh, uh, you know, some of the younger men in the church that might tell them, hey, it's OK to hang out with these people. So, again, we see that Peter's actions bled over. It wasn't just Peter that left. His actions bled over. And there's actually multiple people that went and followed him and is hanging out with these people. And they could be compelled to be circumcised and all of these other things. So uh, go to Exodus 16. Exodus 16. So we see that being conformed to the world is natural. Uh, and, and it's natural to want to be conformed to the world. It's natural to do these things. We have to forsake that. We have to forsake the flesh. But again, that's something that can spread and affect other people if we don't take heed to that and take care of that. All right, Exodus chapter 16. The next thing is murmuring. Murmuring. And we all murmur. That's complaining, okay? That's complaining. 
Exodus 16, verse number 2 says, And the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And Moses and Aaron said unto the children of Israel, At even, then ye shall know that the Lord hath brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning ye shall see the glory of the Lord, for that he heareth your murmurings against the Lord. And what we are, are we, that ye murmur against us? And Moses said, This shall be when the Lord shall give you in the evening flesh to eat, and in the morning bread for the full. For that the Lord heareth your murmurings, which ye murmur against him. And what are we? Your murmurings are not against us, but against the Lord. So you're affecting other people whenever you murmur, whenever you complain all the time. You're teaching others that it's okay to complain. If you are a complainer, then you are teaching your kids. If you just walk around the house all the time and you complain just about everything, you complain about everything. We recently went to, uh, uh, and there's some of you that were there, we went to that uh, uh, a place that I, I won't say, we're at a Shoney's, right? And this lady comes in and she sits down and she's like, I'm not going to get the buffet, there's flies on the buffet. We're like, okay, well it's hot in here. I'm just going to get a salad. So she gets a salad, so this, this lettuce is wilted. I mean, it's like literally, like within a, a 10 minute period, it's like five complaints, this lady. I mean, it just drags everybody down, you know? And, and everybody doesn't want to hear it. Nobody really wants to hear a complainer. Everybody complains, but nobody wants to hear a complainer. So if you complain, all right, and you have an issue with complaining all the time, number one, you need to stop it. You need to stop doing that, okay? But secondly, if you're home and you're complaining about this, I'm complaining about the bills, I'm complaining about uh, uh, situations, I'm complaining about the job, I'm complaining about whatever it may be, you know what you're teaching your kids? To complain. Exactly. You're teaching your kids to, you know, because your kids, they wake up in a bed, right? They get out of bed and they go, they have breakfast and they have a mom and a dad that love them and they have a family. And what you're teaching them is, you know what, that's not enough. You, uh, you, God's not doing a good job to, to take care of you. You need to complain about it. And you know what, as we see in the passage, it says you're not murmuring against mom and dad for doing a bad job. They're murmuring against God. Because in one breath you're telling your kids that God provides for all your needs and we need to trust God and God's going to take care of us when you say their prayers at night. God, please help us. Thank you for all of our stuff. Uh, uh, please help us. And in the next breath you're complaining about everything. So what those kids are thinking is, man, God is doing a really sloppy job taking care of mom and dad. We have a house, we have food, we have clothes on our backs, we have a nice bed, uh, we have a family that loves us, takes us to church, but evidently that's not enough. God should be doing more for my mom and dad because God should be giving dad that job that he's always complaining about. God should be giving mom that, uh, uh, that uh, beach trip that she's always complaining about. That's what your kids are learning whenever you complain all the time. And this complaining, this murmuring will fester inside of you and it'll spread, it'll spread to your kids and your kids are going to grow up complainers. So that's what's going to happen. So again, we need to make sure, we need to take a step back. We need to make sure that we're focused on this, this uh, complaining, this murmuring, and we need to get it out of our system is what we need to do. Go to Proverbs 22. Anger. Anger. I can't tell you how many people uh, that I've ran into that are just like, well, I just have a temper. I just have a temper. Well, I just have a temper. I don't care if you have a temper. You know what? We all could have a temper, you know, potentially in the right circumstances, you know. And I've told people a million times, I said, what if I had a temper? Well, I just can't control myself. What if I can't control myself, huh? I just show up at your house. Instead of, like, take a report, I just shoot you. You know what I mean? <laughs> I just, you know? What if I just can't control my? I get mad at you because, you know... <laughs> You're an idiot and you've created this problem or whatever. And I'm tired of coming to your house and I've been to your house like five times, right? So I just come in and I can't control myself, so I just come in and kill everybody. You know what I mean? You guys are like, man, Pastor Fritz is a psycho. <laughs> but what I'm saying is, is I'm trying to, I always tell these people, hey, you have to exercise restraint in your life, okay? You just can't go, uh, uh, just go off the handle everywhere and everything, you know? Because you know what? In your life, People are going to wrong you. People are going to talk bad about you. People, you're going to go and you're going to be in a, in a hurry and there's going to be somebody in front of you buying like $100 of lottery tickets, you know what I mean? And scratching them. Things are going to happen that are going to make you mad. People are going to talk about you. People are going to post junk about you on Facebook. People are going to send texts about you. Uh, uh, your, your kids are going to do stupid things that you want to strangle your kids. People are going to make you mad in life. You know, friends, family, 
coworkers. People are going to make you mad in life, but you know what? We need to be uh, swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath, okay? You don't need to be going off and, and just losing your mind on everyone. We need to be very, very patient people as Christians, and we don't need to be angry. Somebody shouldn't describe you as the angry guy. He's always mad. He's always angry. You know, if he was the Hulk, he would be the Hulk all the time. He would never be uh, uh, Bruce Banner. You know, he'd always be the Hulk because he's always mad. You know, <laughs> you don't need to be that guy, okay? Proverbs 22, verse number 24. And you said, well, well, I thought you were talking about sins that can spread. Well, cancer, or I'm sorry, uh, uh, anger can spread, just like cancer can spread. Anger can spread. It says, make no friendship, Proverbs 22, 24, with an angry man, and with a furious man thou shalt not go. Look what it says. Lest thou learn his ways, and get a snare to thy soul. So again, anger can spread just like anything else. Just like bitterness can, just like uh, uh, resentment can, just like unbelief can, anger can spread. And you know what? If you work with a guy, and he's always hateful, he's always angry, he's always always mad, stay away from that guy. Okay? Stay away from that guy. I'm not saying don't be nice to the guy. Hey, man, you know, what's going on? How are you? Uh, uh, I'm, uh, but I'm saying that shouldn't be your buddy that you're going to eat lunch with. That shouldn't be your buddy that you're hanging out with. I don't care if the guy's saved or not. I wouldn't be hanging out. Because look what the Bible says. It doesn't say an unsaved man. Make no friendship with an angry man. Okay? And with a furious man thou shalt not go. And as far as the furious man, here's the application of that. If you get one of your buddies call you and he's like, Man, I am so mad about whatever it is. Come on, I'm going to go and find uh, 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 this policeman, uh, Officer Grady. I'm going to go find him, and I'm going to whoop him, you know. Come on, and he's furious about it. Don't you go with him, you know what I mean? Don't you go. People do foolish things in anger. They do foolish things in anger. People, I mean, things that we would, they wouldn't normally do, okay? So again, if somebody's furious, you don't go with that individual. But look what it says, lest thou learn his ways. This is a spread. Spreading sin. This is a cancer sin that can affect you. Don't hang out with angry people. And we don't need to be the angry guy that nobody hangs out with, you know? Man, I'm not going to hang out with Brother, brother uh, Jason because he's just, he's just mad all the time, you know? Why are you mad, bro? What's that, uh, that shirt? Yeah. We shouldn't be like that, okay? We shouldn't be the angry guy. All right. Cancers in the Christian life can be fed. Did you know that you can feed cancer? You can actually feed cancer, and you can uh, uh, increase the, the rate uh, that, that cancer cells grow by what you eat. If you eat refined sugar, sodas, carbonated beverages, white flour, farmed fish, hydrogenated oils, and processed foods, those type of things, it will feed cancer cells. You're like, well, how will it do that? Well, those are things that just, I mean, just horrible for your body, right? And that your body's going to be like, man, I have got to get this junk out of here. So again... So your cancer cells are like, you know, they're over there just tearing down, destroying and all that stuff. They're like, you know, the, 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 uh, the trash guys, they're over there trying to clean up the Snickers bar and trying to clean up all of this stuff. And I'm just over here just having a heyday, okay? But again, we can feed these things. But you know what? You think about somebody that gets diagnosed with cancer. What's the, what's the first thing that they look at? Their diet, right? Somebody gets uh, uh, diagnosed, they're like, man, I need to look at my diet. I need to look at my environment. I need to start juicing. You know, all these people start juicing. They buy a, uh, uh, one of those high dollar juicers. I can't even think of Vitamix or whatever. They can like, uh, you can put like a, uh, uh, we could probably put the offering plate in there and it would eat it. <laughs> so again, they start juicing, you know, and they juice because they're trying to get a lot of vitamins and minerals, you know, stuff that we probably all should be eating now, you know, and, and let me just say, we all should be cleaning up our diet all the time, okay? We need to eat better, myself included. Go to Psalms chapter number 12, Psalms 12. But you know what? They're trying to get all the vitamins, all the minerals that, they, that, they, uh, that their body needs, uh, try to weed out some of these bad things, this, this bad food uh, that, that, that's feeding this cancer, that's causing these growths. You're going to Psalms 12. I'm going to read for you Job 23, verse 12. Because you know what? We need to be getting our vitamins and our minerals from the Bible is what we need to be getting to fight these cancerous sins, okay? Job 23, 12 says, Neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. The Bible says in Jeremiah 15, 16, The words were found, and I did eat them, and the word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of mine heart. For I am called by the name, uh, thy name, O Lord God of hosts. You're in uh, Psalms 12. Look at verse number 6. It says, The words of the Lord are what? 
pure words. Do you see that? Pure. Right. There's nothing defiled in it. It's not hydrogenated oil. It's not the, 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 the carbonated drink of the NIV. It's not the hydrogenated oil of the ESV. It's not a false version. It is the pure Word of God, the King James Bible, that we should be eating. And the Word of the Lord are pure words. Look what it says. As silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. We don't need the processed NIV, the ESD, you know, the, what, the STD, whatever the other weird versions are, right? You don't want the news, you know? You don't want the Fox News app. You don't want the local news app that's feeding all this negativity, feeding this bitterness, you know? And if social media is affecting you, you don't want that garbage either. Because right. there's a lot of garbage on social media, you know? I like the funny memes, like where it's got the crocodile with the little bait, the, the actual croc shoe in its mouth, you know? I like those funny memes. And it says, hey, the mother croc carries its baby in its mouth and it's a shoe, you know? <laughs> But anyway, I like those little <laughs> silly things. And I like seeing positive things. I like seeing pictures of the McMillans and the Cooks down there at Revival Baptist Church. I like seeing things like that. I don't like seeing a lot of the filth and the wickedness and the drama that's on there. you know. So I'm telling you, there's a lot of stuff that can keep you bitter. A lot of stuff that can make you angry. A lot of stuff that can ha cause unbelief on there. So we need to, uh, uh, if, if that's an issue for you, get rid of social media. okay? Get rid of social media. But having said that, uh, we need pure words. We need the Bible in our minds. We don't need wicked music. We don't need rock and roll music. We don't need pop music. We don't need the filth of the world. And you know what? If you work in a, an office where they pump music in there, because some do, some people do, uh, where they'll actually pump music in there, uh, I'm not saying I feel sorry for you, but you know what? You need to make sure especially that you tran be transformed by the renewing of your mind by getting the Word of God in your mind, okay? You need that pure words. You don't need them to give you all the, uh, the processed food and all the GMO food and all the hydrogenated food and all of these things that's feeding the cancer of bitterness, the cancer of unbelief, the cancer of anger. You don't need all of that garbage, okay? But you think about it, people clean up the environment they're in also. They clean up their lifestyle, you know, not to be around persons. We saw a couple of places that are cancerous, people that are going to feed those cancerous sins. And it says, like in Proverbs, we talked about, it says, lest thou learn his ways and get a snare to thy soul. Talking about an angry person. You know, if a guy is saved, try to talk to him. You know, maybe show him the guy he's cancerous. Hey, man, you know, like we said, hey, you mad, bro? Why are you mad, bro? You know, <laughs> if Sonny's mad, hey, maybe be like, hey, man, what is going on? You know? You're a saved guy or whatever. You know, what is going on? Try to talk to the guy. Try to be an encouragement to the guy. But you know what? I mean, if he won't, uh, if he won't listen to you and he's just still going to be mad, then the Bible says don't hang out with the guy. But you know what? If he's unsaved, try to get him saved. But you know what? Don't hang out with cancerous people. Don't. And I'm telling you, you say, uh, should I just totally uh, avoid them? No, but they shouldn't be your close buddies. You know what I mean? Somebody that, that displays unbelief, somebody that displays anger, somebody that you know is bitter. That don't need to be our buddies. We don't need to be hanging out with those people all the time. Go to Matthew chapter number 5. Matthew chapter 5. We're going to be in Matthew. It looks like the duration... But how do we treat cancers in the, in the Christian life, huh? How do we treat them? How do we take care? You know, we, we, we've been diagnosed. We've looked at ourselves. We've been diagnosed. And we have some of, this, uh, some of these cancerous sins in us. We have some bitterness. We have some anger issues. How do we fix these things? Matthew 5, verse number 43. It says, You have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies and bless them that curse you and do good to them that hate you and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. So the first thing that I would submit to you to fight this is prayer. Is prayer. You're like, well, that's pretty generic. No, it's not. It's not generic because the person that you're bitter against, you need to pray for that person every day multiple times a day. If somebody you're angry about, if I'm angry about my job, I'm angry about uh, uh, you know, my cousin, I'm angry about my kids, I'm angry about my wife, I'm angry about uh, somebody at church, you need to pray for that person a lot. A lot. And you need to pray that God will bless that person. You need to pray that God will help them have a good day. You need to pray that God will uh, repair your heart towards that person. But you need to pray earnestly for that person and bless that person. I, I, I pray that they have a good day. I hope, God, that you would bless them. I pray that you would bless their hands, Lord. I pray that you would take care of them, their family, help them have a, a great day. Multiple times a day, pray for that person. I mean, multiple times a day. I was involved in a shooting back in 2000. 
2009, I think it was. Yeah, 2009 maybe. I was involved in a shooting, and the first thing that I did after, I mean, after it's, you know, kind of the, the, the smoke cleared, like literally the smoke cleared, but uh, after the smoke cleared and the dust settled or whatever, I thought to myself, and this is kind of a weird thought, and I'm not saying that I'm super Christian or anything like that, but you listen to this advice. I thought to myself, I thought, I'm going to pray for this man. I don't want this man to, to I don't want to hate this guy. You know what I mean? I don't care. I mean, the guy tried to run me over, okay? I don't care. I don't want to hate this person. I don't want to, in 10 years, be thinking to myself that I hate this person. You know, I don't want to do that. I don't want that to fester inside of me. And I prayed for him every day, multiple times a day for weeks because I wanted that. I didn't want that in my heart. And you know what? I don't hate him, you know? And you know what? I never did hate him. So again, it works. I believe it works. And so you need to pray for people multiple times a day. Go to Matthew 18. Matthew 18. So prayer is the first thing that we can do to get these cancerous sins out of our lives. Prayer. So whatever you're angry with, whatever you're, you know, as far as the unbelief, prayer. Second, forgiveness. Matthew 18, verse number 21 says, Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and, and I forgive him? Till seven times. It's like, okay. And you get people that say that all the time. Let me ask you a question. If this guy's wronged me seven times and he's wronging me again, what should I do? You know, people ask, you know, like foolish questions where they, they, they put some kind of quantity on something, you know. If this guy has let his neighbor come into my, you know, his dog come into my yard and use the bathroom in my yard, you know, seven times, and he does it an eighth time, what should I do? You know, people ask all these questions. They'll put like a, a, a limit on it, right? And that's what this guy's doing. Uh, I'm sorry, Peter is doing uh, to, to the Lord Jesus. Look at what Jesus says. Verse number 22. He saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times. He says, but until 70 times seven. That's 490 times, okay? So here is my response to you. If somebody does you dirty or they do you wrong, how many times are you supposed to forgive that person? 490 times. So if you've forgiven them 490 times and they wrong you again, come to me and we'll talk, okay? Because I guarantee you over the course of life, one individual, number one, is not going to uh, 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 do you wrong 490 times, but you're not going to be able to keep up with that, you know? And Jesus is not showing a number. Jesus is like is saying, you need to forgive, period. You need to forgive. Yeah, there's like tick marks. We're keeping tick marks. <laughs> Buddy, you know, you're like, you're like, uh, uh, you know, you're like 488. You're like two more times. <laughs> two more times is it. It. And then no forgiveness. No forgiveness. But again, we need to be forgiving people. Very forgiving people. Because again, as relationships develop, as we get closer, as time goes on, you're going to get mad at me at some point. I'm going to get mad at you at some point. I mean, you know, it, it, it's inevitable. And when I say mad, I'm not talking about that I'm going home and I'm fuming and I'm like, I've got to hit a heavy bag because I'm so angry. You know, and I'm not talking about that. But, you know, we're all going to get aggravated at one another at one point. But we need to be very forgiving people because you think about it. If a lie will send you to hell, one lie will send you to hell. I don't know about you all, but I've done a whole lot more than a lie. Okay? And I've done a whole lot more than one lie. Okay? And God sent His Son, and He was perfect. He lived a perfect Amen. life. And He died for all my sins, and He paid for all my sins. Amen. And He gave me forgiveness, right? And He gave you forgiveness. And if He can do that for your sorry, unworthy butts and mine, hey, we can forgive other people, you know? You had the God of the universe hanging on a cross. I mean, I, I get choked up thinking about it. Hanging on a cross, right? I mean, He created these Roman soldiers, right? In eternity past, he knew about them, and he knew that they were going to treat him like this, and they knew that they were going to spit on him, and yet he hung there. Why? Because he could forgive you. He loves you. Amen. He don't want you to go to hell. Amen. And you can't forgive your brother, huh? You can forgive them. You let it go because God said to let it go. Because he let it go, Amen. so you need to let it go. Amen. We need to be unforgiving. Ah, oh, he wronged me. Who cares? How many people wronged Jesus, huh? Amen. And he took it, so you can take it. Move on with your life. You're not that important, and your little squabble isn't worth it. Okay? So move on. Go to Matthew 14. Forgiveness, but we need to be forgiving people. You don't need to hold a grudge. 
A grudge will kill you all. You know, my dad held a grudge. Okay, we're, we're just go, we're gonna we're gonna go to hillbilly land. Okay, all right, you ready? We're going we're going to uh, we're taking a time machine. We're going uh, back in time to a hillbilly church. Okay, they had a deacons meeting right years ago, and uh, the, the vote was it's so stupid. The vote was is whether to patch the roof right or to fix the roof. That was the vote. Okay, in the deacon meeting. Okay. And you guys are like, man, that sounds crazy, okay? Well, my dad got mad because he voted to, I think, just patch the roof, right? And they're going to, they're gonna, uh, uh, see, I mean, who cares? You know what I mean? How stupid. But we left the church. We left the church, and, you know, and we went to a different church or whatever. But my dad harbored resentment and bitterness and hate and anger in his heart for years and years and years and years. And he still, if he would be honest with you, he doesn't like these people at all. But he hated these people to the point that we couldn't even mention these people's name at all in our home. He, wouldn't, he didn't want to even hear their names. Nothing about them. And that bitterness ate him alive. And my dad, he's unsaved and he has a host of health problems. A host of health problems. Why? Because he smoked when he was younger? No. Because he's hated people and he's held anger and bitterness and resentment in his heart for decades and it will eat you alive just like cancer will. Amen. So you need to get this garbage out of your heart. You need to get the anger out of your heart. You need to get the bitterness out of your heart. You need to get resentment out of your heart and you need to be forgiving. Because Jesus Christ forgave us and we need to be forgiving and get this garbage. You know, who cares? You think about it. We get so mad. Have you ever been involved with an argument with your wife? You know, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, you know, oh, we don't ever argue. Yeah. You will, okay? You get, you're married long enough, you will, you know? You ever get a married, uh, an argument with your wife and, and the argument just lasts forever, you know? And you're telling them, hey, you know, because they're, they're, they're mad. You're like, hey, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. You're not supposed to be mad at me. You're telling that and you're mad, you know. <laughs> Get over it, you know. I'm sleeping on a couch or whatever, you know. But I mean, but I'm saying if, if thing lasts for like days and days and days, you know. And then you think to yourself, you're like, why am I mad? What was we even arguing about? I have no idea. And, and, and you, ever, you ever get in, in an argument with somebody, like whether it be your wife or whatever, you know, but you get in an argument with somebody and you get to the point where you forget what you were arguing about, so you, make, you just make some kind of random point. You know what I mean? And you know, it isn't even, it's not even relevant, you know? Well, you know what? Uh, uh, yeah! And they're like, what? You're like, oh man, I don't, I don't even remember what he's arguing about, you know? So I say all that to say, our little petty squabbles and, and, and they're stupid, okay? The majority of them are just stupid. Let them go and be done with it. Don't harbor that garbage in your heart over a roof, and, 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 you know, to patch it or do that and let it destroy your life and destroy your health. Don't do stupid stuff like that, okay? We are Christians. We are God's people. And you know what? We are to be better than the world out there. We are to be better to the world. There's nothing more disgusting than you see somebody that harbors bitterness and resentment and holds grudges and I'm going to get him back and you wait for this and, 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 and they're just very grudgeful, uh, vengeful person, and they're a Christian. It's disgusting, and I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to hear about it. Okay, out of, out of us. I don't want it to be true, <laughs> but I don't want to. We that shouldn't be us. Okay, Matthew fourteen. You talk about the fear and the unbelieving. I believe are hand in hand. Okay, because <coughs> you wouldn't be scared if you believed in it, right? If you believed in God's promises, you wouldn't be scared. That's why people are scared to die because they don't believe in the promise that He can preserve them. He don't believe in the promise of then this is the uh, uh, that He promised you know in hope of eternal life. Which God that promised before the world began, right? They don't believe in that promise. That's why they're scared to die. Oh, I hope I've been good enough. I hope I've been good enough. So fear and unbelief, they're hand in hand. Hand in glove, fear and unbelief. Matthew 14, verse number 28 says, Then Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me to come onto the water. This is the Lord Jesus is walking on the water. What was it, th those heretics or those... Uh, uh, bunch of unsaved people talking about that there was like stepping stones that he was stepping on. You ever heard that garbage? They try to explain away the miracles of the Bible, you know? Hopefully they're in hell right now. Somebody's saying that. Matthew uh, 14, 29 says, And he said, Come. Jesus is on the water. And, he, and Peter said, Hey, if it's you, bid me to come. And Jesus says, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. So again, 
What's the goal? The goal is to walk out there, right? And what's he doing? He's getting distracted, right? He's getting distracted. He's loud. He's looking at the wind and all of these other things. Look what it says. And he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith. You see that? It says he was afraid. O thou of little faith. Wherefore didst thou doubt? There you go. He doesn't have any faith. He's doubting. It says, When they were come into the ship, the wind ceased. And they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth thou art the Son of God. So you see kind of a definition. You say, Well, what does it mean to have a little faith? He says, O thou of little faith, wherefore dost thou doubt? Because you say, Well, how do I have little faith? You have a little faith because you doubt. That's why you have little faith. You know, we think, Well, how, how do I get more faith? Luke 17 uh, verse 5, you can go over there, we're not too far. Flip a couple of books, Luke 17, verse 5. It says, and the apostles said unto the Lord, he says, increase our faith. So that's what they're telling Jesus. Hey, we want more faith. Please increase our faith. Which I'll tell you, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Amen. You want to increase your faith, you, you read the Bible, you listen to the Bible on audio, but you get the Word of God in your mind, in your heart, and you'll, you'll get, have more faith, okay? Luke 17, 5, it says, And the apostles said unto them, Lord, increase our faith. Lord, we want more faith. And the Lord said, If ye had faith as a grain of a mustard seed. So is that a lot? You ever seen a mustard seed? It's tiny. Very tiny. And you might say to this sycamine tree, Be thou plucked up by the root, and be thou planted in the sea, and it should obey you. So he's saying it doesn't take much at all. It doesn't take much. So we don't need more faith. Because it doesn't take much. You just need less doubt. That's what you need. You read something in the Bible. The Bible he gives you a promise. Less doubt. You don't doubt that promise. That's how to get rid of fear and unbelief. You get that word in your heart, and whatever the word says, you believe what that says. Again, you just you, you get rid of that doubt. Because you don't need a whole lot of faith. But these sins are natural. You know, we're closing. We don't think much about, about them because they're natural. You know, people want to look at outward things. Oh, you drink, you smoke, you cuss, you do, you know, all of these other things that these, these like holiness crowds focus on. But they don't focus on the stuff that they, don't, they, they can't see. And that's the things that we let go unchecked. Why? Because we can't see him. I can't roll by and see, you know, Brother Eastat, and I'm like, oh, I bet he's an angry guy. Unless he's like smashing the place up. You know what I mean? I can't do that. I can't walk. I can't sit there and, and, and look at you guys right now and say, oh, bitter, bitter, angry, unbelieving. You know, you can't see these things. Therefore, if I can't see these things, see, see if I, we're just going to say that I like, I, I smoke pot, right? We're going to say that I did or I smoked cigarettes, whatever, right? I'm going to hide that from you all. You know what I mean? I'm going to hide that. Uh, I'm not going to smoke around you. Oh, you know? Spraying the, uh, 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 the, the Glade or whatever, you know, the air freshener, the felony forest. Like, look at Pastor Fritz. He's got like 65 uh, uh, air fresheners on his car, you know? <laughs> Your car, it always has the new car scent. You know, I've got new car. I've got like uh, those Christmas trees all in, the, all in, the, in the vents, right? <laughs> but I would try to hide that from you. But you know what? You can't see my bitterness. You can't see my resentment. You can't see my anger. Unless I'm like, again, like smashing things up. You can't see my unbelief. You can't see my fear. So we, leave these, we let these things go unchecked. Because I, I don't have to hide that. You know what I mean? So we allow these things to fester and to grow in our life. These sins are natural. And you know what? If you leave them unchecked, they will grow. They will grow. They can overtake you. They can start affecting others. Before you know it, you have a cancerous church and a cancerous family. Your family's unbelieving. Your family's having issues with anger, with bitterness, with resentment, with murmuring, with complaining. You know, I've left that out a lot. We all complain probably too much. No? So again, we're going to affect others if we don't check these things out. We need to get this stuff in check. We don't need to feed this. We need to get this stuff out of us because if it's left unchecked... And what do they, they always say about cancer? Early intervention, right? Finding out early. Seeing early. Oh, wow. Just, you know, just like I did with that guy you know, back in 2009. Oh, wow. You know what? Uh, uh, brother, brother Corey's wronged me. Early intervention. Wow. There's a potential there for me to, to be, be, uh, be bitter against him. I better pray for him. I better pray for him. I don't want that bitterness in me. Early intervention. Early detection. To check that out and make sure that this stuff... That way, we need to make sure that that stuff gets taken care of before it's a problem. Okay? Before it's a problem. And we don't need to feed that stuff either. And again, the whole thing you think about initially. How does it get started? You get focused on the wrong things and you allow these things to go unchecked. Right?
Because if we do what we're supposed to do, we read the Bible, we follow what the Bible says, we're going soul winning, we're praying for our enemies and things like that, you know, things kind of will fix themselves. Okay? But again, we don't want cancer, cancerous sins to affect you in, uh, in, in this life. All right, let's bow our heads for prayer.